Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome to the Fashion Bunker. I have been shopping for, well, I was running off to a place from A to B uh, for work purposes, more or less, and um, I had to, you know, catch a glimpse of this. So today we have a very special treat for you guys. This will be an unboxing as well as a review of something that I have been waiting for for quite a while now. <sighs> and finally it's here. This has been missing in my collection and I don't know for what reason I haven't been, I, I never really got to purchase it and maybe because up to now I didn't really value so much how special this fragrance is and it is definitely, definitely one of Chanel's exclusives most uh, underestimated perfumes. So it is number 18. Chanel number 18. Uh, let's unbox it. I Oh, by the way, look how cute these little um, new Chanel perfume, uh, not vouchers, what do you call these, like invoice little envelopes are. It says, I love Coco. And then you got the Chanel on the back and inside you got, you got your bill. So put this aside, put this aside. Let's unbox it. Uh, I'm losing my voice. By the way, while I am unboxing this, and it's always super exciting to unbox something, actually to have the right timing so that I can unbox it with you guys together because usually I'm not filming when this happens, but now, now we're, we're managing it all. There you have it. Did I get the right perfume? Yeah, number 18. <laughs> all is good. Okay, so... Um, this is the lightest, together with the Eau de Cologne, it's the lightest liquid you might have in the Chanel Les Exclusives line. Uh, it is literally like water. <laughs> the, the spray's backwards. Okay, let's shift it to the front. We got our little magnet stopper right over there. Uh, made in France, Chanel Paris, 75 milliliter, 2.5 fluid ounces. Um, I am drinking champagne, darling, for the occasion. Uh, first of all, reminiscent and in tribute to Lanier Smith. I haven't made this, by the way, Lanier. Um, well, it's not a cocktail. It's literally just champagne. But still, it's bubbly, bubbly. Mm. Here's to you guys. Ooh. Check out Lanier's channel. Ch chan <laughs> Check out Lanier's Chanel, by the way. I want to say channel. Um, best perfume reviewer out there. Anyway, ooh, bubbly. Okay, now another reason why I'm drinking the alcohol is because Chanel number no. 18 is literally uh, a sort of brandy experience. Now I, I'm not a not, I'm not very fond of drinking brandy, so uh, I will not be drinking brandy for the occasion. But let's spray it on. Number 18, you might ask yourself, mm, why number 18? Well, number 18 is. Uh, the address in the um, Place Vendôme number 18 where Chanel's jewelry, like the Haute Joyalerie, oh, the high jewelry is sold, basically. So Coco would pass by it, you know, when she would walk from the Ritz to Rue Cambon every day, and, you know, that, that Place Vendôme would be kind of a very symbolic place. So number 18 is supposed to resemble, in a way, a jewel, and I do believe that it manages to represent a jewel much more so than 1932, the perfume that um, supposed to represent the 1932 diamond collection by Chanel, her first diamond collection. So let's see what the notes are in this beautiful fragrance. Um, quite simple and linear uh, structure. It's not like we have this classic pyramid of top, uh, middle, and base notes. We have um, ambret, musk mallow, fruity notes, iris, flowers, woody notes. I do believe there's a bit of sandal in there. There's kind of this far away reminiscence of, uh, of Bois de Zille. Now, Bois de Zille is very different, but this is some sort of hybrid between gardenia and Bois de Zille. Now, if gardenia were to be concentrated into a perfume like directly from the flower, which we know is kind of impossible. Um, it would be the gardenia mixed with Bois de Zille. But what really attracts me so much to number 18 is, and this is something that 
some of you might find interesting, most of you won't, because I don't know how many of you really know about this particular persona and person and actress, Holly Woodlawn. Now, Holly Woodlawn used to be, you know, uh, Andy Warhol's superstar. Holly Woodlawn passed away, unfortunately, just uh, a quite short time ago. May she rest in peace. Um... I have seen an interview with her. It was some sort of like snippet interview sketch, you know, artistically kind of put, uh, where number 18 was to be seen kind of in one of the, the close-up shots. So I kind of envisioned number 18 to be Holly Woodlawn's perfume, even though she never really stated it in that interview. You just see the bottle at one point. And since she liked to guzzle... And since the brandy is in here, quite prominent, I kind of love to envision, you know, this sort of um, Holly Woodlawn um, fabulosity, you know, surrounding this perfume. Andy Warhol superstardom. This is definitely the most strange of, kind of the most outsticking of the Les Exclusives by uh, Chanel. Till now. Now, uh, mind you, I am still waiting to smell how the new fragrance Boy smells. That might be a kind of a variation. But as I have heard, Boy is coming out as an eau de parfum, not an eau de toilette. Number 18 is available only as eau de toilette in 75 milliliter spra uh, spra spray bottles, as well as 200 milliliter spray bottles, also available as sample size 2 ml spray and 4 ml splash bottles. So I do sense this Hollywoodlawn-y type of, of thing going on here. Uh, many people have said that do review perfumes that number 18 is the most niche uh, the Chanel exclusives ever got or gotten. Got. Uh, I, believe, I believe together with Sycamore and maybe Coromandel, this one is definitely the most niche. Um, because it sticks out from the others, you still recognize Chanel within it, within its heart. And yet there's something, I mean, this, the, the ambrette maybe, um, it's the ambrette that makes it perhaps different from the other Chanel exclusives. And maybe the fruity notes with the iris and the woody notes, the sandal, you know, there's something in this fragrance that kind of is reminiscent of the Comme des Garçons fragrances as well, and yet it's more sophisticated than they are. It's slightly acidy on my skin, as Bel Respiro would also be on my skin. I also have to say, many people say that the longevity of this one is very, very, very short. I personally don't agree. At least on my skin, it lasts up to seven hours. And um, mind you, the projection isn't very strong. So you have to kind of sniff it out from your skin. But it's still there, even like six to seven hours after I have sprayed it on my skin. Granted, I don't have like clothes layering it. Like, let's say I would spray it here and nothing would rub against it. I would still sense it after so many hours. Um, however, if you were to place it in a position where the clothes could rub it off, it doesn't really stick to the skin, but it tends to kind of rub off. So that, yes, also happens. But then again, it does stick to the clothes also around six hours. It's not something that kind of sticks around for days and days, no. But then again, you know, to me, every fragrance that kind of is already transparent within the bottle usually makes me believe that uh, it ain't everlasting. Usually the yellow, ambery, darker toned liquids are the ones that kind of stick around forever. For example, uh, Dior's um, Privé Au Noir, it's like this yellow, um, like this green, black, uh, poisonous color. Oh my God, that fragrance sticks around for, for centuries even. But back to number 18. The iris is there. Um, there's something that I would I would say is kind of leathery. Now, who mentioned an orris root in here? Maybe it's the orris root. But there's a leathery touch deep, deep down in there. And that makes it very particular to me because it makes me feel like there's something going on in this fragrance that transcends 
this initial simple kind of like brandy al alcoholic touch it kind of goes in it veers into oh okay we've seen the liquid we've seen the brandy in the glass we've tasted it, it tastes very good but now let's move on and try to figure out where this brandy was made and what sort of container was it aged in and that container has its own smell as well and that particular smell of that container a wooden I mean I would imagine I have not I don't I don't know anything about alcohol and how it's made and how brandies are made but I would imagine them to be made in these like wooden barrels of some sort uh, really old traditional gorgeous wooden barrels made out of expensive woods and, and these woods have their own scents as well and maybe some smoky touch to them so basically we go beyond that brandy and we shift into these wooden barrels now wood it, it says it has woodsy notes even though it's a very clear liquid the wood in here is and this particularly this kind of humid smoky leathery touch of wood that we sense within this fragrance that goes beyond that um, uh, brandy opening note is what kind of portrays to me or kind of paints you know with these quick brushes uh, the, the face and also the roots of number 18. So if we were to kind of just hypothesize the fact that number 18 is called by the Place Vendôme, number 18 uh, jewelry, uh, Chanel jewelry address, it's as if we would be saying, okay, beyond the jewels, beyond this high-end jewelry, we have this store, and beyond that, behind that store, we have the makers uh, that uh, <clears throat> this perfume might be dedicated to. The same goes for the contents of the liquid where we go beyond that brandy and we go into the barrel and into the makers of those barrels and that smokiness of their lives and whatever kind of circulated, you know, uh, in, in their lives or outside of their lives. So it's a fragrance that definitely gives me all of these vibes. And it makes me, even though it's a relatively young fragrance made around 2007 by Jacques Polge, um, it still gives me a very, very strong heritage vibe, a very strong vibe of, of, a, of a deep rooted research that has been made to give a symbology and a meaning, a very intense meaning to a perfume that kind of, if not analyzed deeply enough, can be mistaken for something very lighthearted, light, and something that evaporates quickly. Well, guess what? A lot of us, and this is a tendency I personally have, a lot of my thoughts evaporate quickly too, especially if I'm, you know, drinking some uh, champagne. So the bubbly bubbly kind of makes a lot of my thoughts evaporate. Mm, this is good. Um, and in fact, right now, a thought just left us. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but almost it did. So what I wanted to say is, this perfume kind of mirrors that, how quick we might forget something that's important, something that is kind of um, important, not just to remember, but also to kind of state and repeat over and over again. And this lightheartedness is also due to the alcohol in a way, but nevertheless, deep down within the heart of this fragrance, you sense out the weight of the heritage and the deeper message. So I guess for, for all of us that think about scents as something lighthearted, and we're very quick to judge if a scent doesn't have that longevity and that projection that we expect from a lot of, you know, mucho dinero that we spend on these fragrances. We kind of stop there and we say, nah, not strong enough, moving on. Well, stop right there. I'm not that type of person. I like to also figure out why certain things are the way they are. And if within the bigger scheme of things and puzzle, they kind of match in place and they position themselves in the right place within a particular historic kind of connotation and meaning, then I, I all of a sudden, you know, acquire a lot of respect for these uh, fragrances in particular. And number 18 is also said to be Jacques Polge's favorite of uh, the Les Exclusives range. Allegedly, whether or not that's true or not, we don't know. I would like to understand and believe that it, that, that, that might be the case, particularly because of the... Um, of the fact that it is indeed so different from all the others. And this Comme des Garçons kind of touch 
the more you smell it on your skin, the more it evaporates because the Comme des Garçons perfumes tend to have that maybe depth at the beginning, but then they become effervescent later on. This one is effervescent in the beginning, and now it's getting deeper. And we've moved beyond those barrels, and now we're, we're hitting the makers of, of this fragrance. And we hit a secret, a big mystery. The mystery, I think, that most uh, brands that really devote and dedicate a lot of money, time, and research, and love and devotion, blood, sweat, and tears into creating these scents, the mystery of how a brand manages to create perfumes that match the sensitivity and the design of a, of a certain fashion brand. Now, I've been mentioning this in other perfume reviews of mine in the past, but I'll repeat it now again. You know, some of you say, oh, we love how Angel uh, from uh, Thierry Mugler smells incredibly intense for days and days and days, how Alien does as well. And then I, you know, I said to you guys, yes, but let's not forget one important thing. Uh, these perfumes mirror to a T uh, the message behind Thierry Mugler's, you know, fashion statements. It's all about these huge gestures, these alien-like creatures and sculptures that literally walk down and up the catwalk. These are memorable pieces that just like imprint themselves in our mind and they're like sculptural and almost theatrical, almost extremely theatrical and sci-fi movie-esque. So the perfume has to resemble that strength. It has to mirror that strength. And it was very well executed with an angel and amen and uh, alien and so on and so forth. So Thierry Mugler represents that. Chanel is more about subtlety, it's more about you have to struggle to understand certain things, to understand certain patterns, to understand certain des design, design decisions and researches and heritage that go behind the brand. So when number 18 delicately kind of approaches me and, and my olfactory senses, I totally get it. I understand why it does that. I understand why it's not screaming out of its lungs uh, to, to tell the world, I'm here, I'm here. No. Number 18 is a secret. It's a mystery. You have to discover it. You have to figure out where that key is, how to unlock that pattern, that door to that, you know, number 18 uh, address on Plus One Dome to figure out what is going on in those ateliers, how things are really made. You know, what is the story behind each and every single piece? And I think number 18 holds the key to understanding the entire range of Les Exclusives by Chanel, created by Jacques Paul in particular. Now that his son, uh, Olivier, took, took over, um, probably things will change. But as far as understanding all of the Les Exclusives up to Misia and Boy, um, this one definitely, to me personally, offers that key because it's right in between the almost invisible but extremely high-end class Eau de Cologne, for example, and the most screaming and opulent and decadent Coromandel. This one is right there in between, and it kind of offers us both. It offers us that opulence of expensive decadent brandy, but it also offers us the modest and honest hands of the artisans and the makers that, or the brewers that would create uh, all of these alcohols. So it gives us the final product, but it also gives us in our minds and in our, in our olfactory sensitivities um, the initial product, the raw materials. And I guess that ambret within here is that raw material we have that kind of keeps reminding us of the fact that there is a lot of modesty in there. Same thing goes for the Chanel bags. With Chanel bags, in particular the Timeless Classics, the reissues, you know, the classic ones, uh, they all have on the interior the burgundy uh, leather lining or fabric lining within some seasonal pieces. That burgundy is supposed to allegedly is reminiscent and represents uh, not just Chanel's, you know, need to have a different color, not just the black color on the interior of the bag so that, you know, you could kind of check and see what's in your bag quicker, but also the color of the nuns from her orphanage back in the day when she was an orphan. And every time you open this luxurious, expensive bag, inside you have that modesty, something that keeps on reminding you that when you're looking inside of that bag, what is inside are your roots, your heritage, where you're coming from. And in her case, it was being an orphan, being alone, fatherless, motherless, um, poor. But that reminds you also of the struggles you had to conquer and go through to get where you are today. So, um, in a way, this 
type of reminding ourselves of where we really come from and the sensitivity that we should never lose on the way on or on our path towards whatever glory, great, greater goods or learning more about ourselves or illumination, whatever. Um, we must never forget really where we're coming from. And that path is paved with, you know, stones and rocks and negative things, but also positive things. And sometimes also keys that kind of allow us and help us to unlock certain doors and trigger certain either memory patterns within ourselves and our souls, or that just kind of give us good and positive vibes that we didn't think were even part of our lives. And all of a sudden they are part of our lives because they get triggered through what? Mostly scents and particular fragrances. And this one definitely is the key of the Les Exclusives range. So if we were to see all the Les Exclusives perfumes by Chanel, uh, made by Jacques-Paul Jaguen, as kind of different characters of a play or of a Shakespeare a novel, a uh, book or whatever, this one would be the key or the key holder. And then, you know, the, the huge court jester uh, would be perhaps, um, I would want to say Coromandel, but then Coromandel might also be the queen. But then the queens sometimes are court jesters, no pun intended. And then like everybody has their kind of role in part. I would have to like think more about it and smell the other perfumes to kind of get more into like a trigger of a memory pattern within me to be able to tell you guys who plays what part. But as far as number 18 is concerned, this is the key or the key holder. And it's really up to you and to your sensitivity to know how to trigger and use that key. So guys, I hope you liked uh, this cryptic <laughs> perfume review. If you have, please do thumb it up. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below about Chanel's exclusives. What are your niche or non-niche favorite fragrances as well and why they are so. And also if you consider any other fragrance to be a key fragrance. Um, don't forget to subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. I am also on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. No matter what you do, no matter what number of Chanel you choose to wear, and no matter how much and how often you wear it or not, don't ever give up on love. Love you guys and see you soon. Bye.